Look at the clock, Patty Morgan, the milkmaid story, Richard Harris, Barham fight. I look at the clock, quoth Winifred Price, as she opened the door to her husband's knock, then paused to give him a piece of advice. You nasty warmint, look at the clock. Is this the way, you wretch, every day you treat her who vowed to love and obey you? At all night. Me in a fright. Staggering home as it's just getting light. You intoxified brute. You insensible block. Look at the clock. Do. Look at the clock. Winifred Price was tidy and clean, her gown was a flowered one, her petticoat green, her buckles were bright as her milking cans, and her hat was a beaver, and made like a man's. Her little red eyes were deep set in their socket holes, her gown tail was turned up, and tucked through the pocket holes, a face like a ferret but tokened her spirit. To conclude, Mrs. Price was not over young, had very short legs and a very long tongue. Now David Price had one darling vice. Remarkably partial to anything nice, not that was good to him came amiss, whether to eat, or to drink, or to kiss. Especially ale if it was not too stale I really believe he'd have emptied a pail. Not that in Wales they talk of their ales. To pronounce the word they make use of might trouble you, being spelt with a C, two R's, and a W that particular day. As I've heard people say, Mr. David Price had been soaking his clay, and amusing himself with his pipe and cheroots, the whole afternoon at the Goat and Boots, with a couple or more soakers, thoroughbred smokers, both, like himself, prime singers and jokers. And, long after day had drawn to a close, and the rest of the world was wrapped in repose, they were roaring out shankin. And our hide why knows? While David himself, to a Sassanoc tune, saying, We've drunk down the sun, boys. Let's drink down the moon. What have we with day to do? Mrs. Winifred Price, t'was made for you. At length, when they couldn't well drink any more, old goats in boots showed them the door. And then came that knock, and the sensible shock David felt when his wife cried, Look at the clock. For the hands stood as crooked as crooked might be, the long at the twelve, and the short at the three. This self-same clock had long been a bone of contention between this Darby and Joan, and often among their pother and rout, when this otherwise amiable couple fell out, Price would drop a cool hint, with an ominous squint at its case, of an uncle of his, who'd a spout. That horrid word, spout, no sooner came out, than Winifred Price would turn her about, and with scorn on her lip, and a hand on each hip, spout herself till her nose grew red at the tip. You thundering willing, I know you'd be killing your wife, eh, a dozen of wives, for a shilling. You may do what you please, you may sell my chemise, Mrs. P was too well bred to mention her stock, but I never will part with my grandmother's clock. Mrs. Price's tongue ran long and ran fast. But patience is apt to wear out at last, and David Price in temper was quick, so he stretched out his hand, and caught hold of a stick. Perhaps in its use he might mean to be lenient, but walking just then wasn't very convenient, so he threw it, instead, direct at her head. It knocked off her hat. Down she fell flat. Her case, perhaps, was not much mended by that, but, whatever it was, whether rage and pain produced a perplexy, or burst a vein, or her tumble induced a concussion of brain, I can't say for certain, but this I can, when, sobered by fright. To assist her he ran, Mrs. Winifred Price was as dead as Queen Anne. The fearful catastrophe named in my last trophy as adding to grim death's exploits such a vast trophy, soon made a great noise. And the shocking fatality ran over, like wildfire, the whole principality. And then came Mr. A. P. Thomas, the coroner, with his jury to sit, some dozen or more, on her. Mr. Price to commence his ingenious defense made a powerful appeal to the jury's good sense. The world he must defy ever to justify any presumption of malice perpense. The unlucky lick from the end of his stick he deplored. He was apt to be rather too quick. But, really, her prating was so aggravating, some trifling correction was just what he meant. All the rest, he assured them, was quite accidental. Then he called Mr. Jones, who deposed to her tones, and her gestures and hence about breaking his bones. While Mr. A. P. Morgan, and Mr. A. P. Rees declared the deceased had styled him a beast, 
and swore they had witnessed, with grief and surprise, the allusions she made to his limbs and his eyes. The jury, in fine, having sat on the body the whole day, discussing the case, and Gent Hody, returned about half past eleven at night the following verdict, we find, sarve her right. Mr. Price, Mrs. Winifred Price being dead, felt lonely, and moped. And one evening he said he would marry Miss Davis at once in her stead. Not far from his dwelling, from the vale proudly swelling, rose a mountain. Its name you'll excuse me from telling, for the vowels made use of in Welsh are so few that the A and the E, the I, O, and the U, have really but little or nothing to do. And the duty, of course, falls the heavier by far on the L, and the H, and the N, and the R. Its first syllable, BN, is pronounceable. Then come two LLS, and two HHS, two FFS, and an N. About half a score RS, and some WS follow, beating all my best efforts at up any hollow, but we shan't have to mention it often, so when we do, with your leave, we'll curtail it to pen. Well, the moon shone bright upon pen that night, when Price, being quit of his fuss and his fright, was scaling its side with that sort of stride a man puts out when walking in search of a bride. Mounting higher and higher, he began to perspire, till, finding his legs were beginning to tire, and feeling oppressed by a pain in his chest, he paused, and turned round to take breath, and to rest. A walk all uphill is apt, we know, to make one, however robust, puff and blow, so he stopped, and looked down on the valley below. O'er fell, and o'er fen, over mountain and glen, all bright in the moonshine, his eye roved, and then all the patriot rose in his soul, and he thought of Wales, and her glories, and all he'd been taught of her heroes of old, so brave and so bold, of her bards with long beards, and harps mounted in gold, of King Edward I, of memory accursed, and the scandalous manner in which he behaved, killing poets by dozens, with their uncles and cousins, of whom not one in fifty had ever been shaved, of the court ball, at which by lucky mishap, Owen Tudor fell into Queen Catherine's lap. And how Mr. Tudor successfully wooed her till the dowager put on a new wedding ring, and so made him father-in-law to the king. He thought upon Arthur, and Merlin of Yore, on Griffith A. P. Conan, and Owen Glendore, on Pendragon, and heaven knows how many more. He thought of all this, as he gazed, in a trice, and on all things, in short, but the late Mrs. Price when a lumbering noise from behind made him start, and sent the blood back in full tide to his heart, which went pit-a-pat as he cried out, What's that? That very queer sound? Does it come from the ground? Or the air, from above or below, or around? It is not like talking, it is not like walking, it's not like the clattering of pot or of pan, or the tramp of a horse, or the tread of a man, or the hum of a crowd, or the shouting of boys? It's really a deuced odd sort of a noise. Not unlike a cart's, but that can't be. For when could all the king's horses and all the king's men, with old Nick for a wagoner, drive one up pen? Price, usually brimful of the lower when drunk, now experienced what schoolboys denominate funk. In vain he looked back on the whole of the track he had traversed. A thick cloud, uncommonly black, at this moment obscured the broad disk of the moon and did not seem likely to pass away soon. While clearer and clearer, t'was plain to the hearer, be the noise what it might, it drew nearer and nearer, and sounded, as Price to this moment declares, very much like a coffin a-walking upstairs. Mr. Price had begun to make up for a run, as in such a companion he saw no great fun, when a single bright ray shone out on the way he had passed, and he saw, with no little dismay, coming after him. Bounding o'er crag and o'er rock, the deceased Mrs. Winifred's grandmother's clock. T'was so. It had certainly moved from its place, and come, lumbering on thus, to hold him in chase. T'was the very same head, and the very same case, and nothing was altered at all but the face. In that he perceived, with no little surprise, the two little window holes turned into eyes blazing with ire, like two coals of fire and the name of the maker was changed to a lip, and the hands to a nose with a very red tip. No. He could not mistake it. T'was she to the life. The identical face of his poor defunct wife. One glance was enough, completely quint. 
stuff. As the doctors write down when they send you their stuff, like a weathercock whirled by a vehement puff, David turned himself around. Ten feet of ground he cleared, in his start, at the very first bound. I've seen people run at West End Fair for cheeses, I've seen ladies run at Bow Fair for chemises, at Greenwich Fair twenty men run for a hat, and one from a bailiff much faster than that. At football I've seen lads run after the bladder, I've seen Irish bricklayers run up a ladder, I've seen little boys run away from a cane, and I've seen, that is, read of, good running in Spain. But I never did read of, or witness, such speed as David exerted that evening. Indeed all I ever have heard of boys, women, or men, falls far short of price, as he ran over Pun. He reaches its brow, he has passed it, and now having once gained the summit, and managed to cross it, he rolls down the side with uncommon velocity. But, run as he will, or roll down the hill, that bugbear behind him is after him still. And close at his heels, not at all to his liking, the terrible clock keeps on ticking and striking, till, exhausted and sore, he can't run any more, but falls as he reaches Miss Davis's door, and screams when they rush out, alarmed at his knock, oh, look at the clock, do, look at the clock, Miss Davis looked up, Miss Davis looked down, she saw nothing there to alarm her, a frown came over her white forehead, she said, it was horrid a man should come knocking at that time of night, and give her mama and herself such a fright, to squall and to bawl about nothing at all, she begged he'd not think of repeating his call, his late wife's disaster by no means had passed her, she'd have him to know she was meat for his master. Then, regardless alike of his love and his woes, she turned on her heel and she turned up her nose. Poor David in vain implored to remain, he dared not, he said, cross the mountain again. Why the fair was obdurate none knows, to be sure, it was said she was setting her cap at the curate. Be that as it may, it is certain the sole hole Price could find to creep into that night was the coal hole. In that shady retreat, with nothing to eat, and with very bruised limbs, and with very sore feet, all night close he kept. I can't say he slept. But he sighed, and he sobbed, and he groaned, and he wept, lamenting his sins and his two broken shins, bewailing his fate with contortions and grins, and her he once thought a complete rara avis, consigning to Satan, vice. Cruel Miss Davis. Mr. David has since had a serious call, he never drinks ale, wine, or spirits, at all, and they say he is going to Exeter Hall to make a grand speech, and to preach, and to teach people that they can't brew their malt liquor too small. That an ancient Welsh poet, one pint R. A. P. Tudor, was right in proclaiming Riston Manuter. Which means the pure element is for the belly meant. And that gents but a snare of old Nick the deluder. And still on each evening when pleasure fills up, at the old goat and boots, with Metheglin, each cup, Mr. Price, if he's there, will get into the chair, and make all his quondam associates stare by calling aloud to the landlady's daughter, Patty. Bring a cigar, and a glass of spring water. The dial he constantly watches. And when the long hands at the xi, and the short at the single quotex, he gets on his legs, drains his glass to the dregs, takes his hat and great coat off their several pegs, with his president's hammer bestows his last knock, and says solemnly, gentlemen, look at the clock.